Was this a blink by Trump, and how significant was it, this idea of pushing the tariffs back, at least on a lot of uh, mainstream consumer goods, at least towards mid-December? Uh, yes, it was a blink. Uh, it is not enormously significant if it's only a three-month delay. So. Well, so, I mean, the fact that we have this delay, I mean, you had a lot of companies pushing back, we know, that basically said that these orders that they needed to get in uh, by the end of the year, or at least uh, for the end of the year, that these tariffs were going to disrupt that. They get a reprieve for now. But when you talk about long-term planning, what are companies going to do in this environment where you don't know if Trump might change his mind, you know, a month from now? Well, I think companies have to make a series of decisions. The most important decision is how they set up their contracting now for next Christmas, for the next holiday season. There's an enormous amount of seasonality in U.S. trade with China. Mm. Our exports to China typically peak in the fourth quarter, the soybean harvest. Mm. Then they fall off uh, from that point on. Our imports from China always peak in the third and fourth quarter, and then there's a sharp drop off in the first quarter. So particularly for electronics, the peak is in the fourth quarter. This allows companies to basically use their existing supply chains and then forces them, if there's no deal, to make the hard choices next year. How much do you think this was a force of lobbying on behalf of the businesses mm. and able to change Trump's mind? How much is this a whim? How much do you think he heard from other advisors? You know, one thing I suspect, uh, given some of the reporting that has come out of Washington, D.C., is that Trade Representative Lighthizer wasn't terribly enthusiastic about the 10 percent tariffs on the 300 billion list. That's the worst set of targets, by definition. The last items on your list are the places where you expect to have the highest cost to yourself. Hmm. And so I think Lighthizer may have been uh, pushing to uh, respect, in some sense, the traditional holiday import surge and give the consumer a little bit of a break, phase in uh, what is a decent sized shock even now. I mean, hmm. we've still work, we're still working through the increase to 25% on the 200 billion list. We still are gonna have 10% tariffs on about another 125 billion. That's not a small shock. Obviously, uh, by doing this delay, Trump conceded what he has denied in the past. He said, oh, it's the Chinese paying the tariffs. It doesn't affect the U.S. Obviously, it does, and that's why he did it on these consumer items. Um, is he really going to let it go? Let them, let's say there's no deal. Will he really let them go into force in an election year, or does this just create another situation in which, due to politics and other domestic issues, it becomes very hard to actually put those tariffs on? I have given up trying to forecast uh, precisely what the president is going to do. In some sense, it, in a big, deep sense, it probably doesn't matter that much whether we put tariffs on the last 150 billion of what was 550 billion of trade with right. China. We've, we will have put tariffs on 400 billion. There isn't currently a clear path to removing all those existing tariffs. And if at some point the negotiations break down, if it's clear that China is not going to buy any U.S. agricultural exports this fall, then you could see either these tariffs go into force or they could go into force with a lag. Well, let's talk about what China could potentially do. I mean, how much more aggressive can they get with regards to monetary policy, fiscal stimulus? Mm -hmm. What options do they have? I think they actually have a decent amount of policy space left. The Fed's rate cuts mm -hmm. have left China's uh, interest rates above those in the U.S. That means there's a little bit more scope for the PBOC to use traditional monetary tools, i.e. rate cuts. And then China has been relatively restrained in its fiscal stimulus uh, to date. I think given the weakness in China's data, and unlike some, I don't attribute all of the weakness to the trade war. Right. I think it, it was a slowdown that started last year before the trade war as China delevered or tried to delever. And then the stimulus that was introduced earlier this year hasn't been as powerful as expected. Logical follow on of that is there's still more scope for more. Making this conversation circular, we started with Sherry talking about Hong Kong. I want to finish with you on Hong Kong because how much of this ad is a distraction for mm. Xi Jinping when he's trying to fight several fronts? I think it makes it much more complicated for Xi to reach a deal with Trump that involves significant concessions in the near term. I also think it would be 
I, you know, we're all, we'll all watch and see whether the troop buildup is a precursor to a more uh, crackdown. Certainly hope it's not. But if it is, I think that will make it harder politically for Trump to reach a deal next year. Real quickly, outside of U.S. China, one story that caught my eye was uh, Angela Merkel maybe hedging a little bit on fiscal stimulus. Not saying they're going to spend a lot of money, but she just said, well, right now is not the time, but we're going to keep monitoring. How big of a deal? A lot of people talking about that and the potential for that to sort of, you know, Germany to do its part. Could, do you think uh, they could make some meaningful waves in sort of the global economy if Germany were to loosen its purse strings a bit to address its own slowdown? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Germany did a modest stimulus this year, but it will still have, according to most forecasts, a 1% of GDP fiscal surplus. Uh, when you are paid a half a percentage point a year, 50 basis points a year to borrow, there's absolutely no need to run a 1% of GDP fiscal surplus when your economy is in the doldrums. I think it would also help change the broader fiscal stance in the euro area. And as part of my thesis that, you know, hey, not everything is just the trade war, right. I think there's been some uh, inside Europe, inside the euro area reasons for Germany's slowdown, which could be addressed 